Energy and Environmental Affairs at Cato. Okay. <laughs> Katie Theoharides, Theoharides, sorry. Um, the Secretary joined the Baker Polito administration in 2016 as Director of Climate and Global Warming Solutions um, in, the, in, the office, in the EEA office. As Director and later Assistant Secretary, she guided the development and implementation of the administration's efforts to safeguard Massachusetts from the impacts of climate change, support cities and towns, and coordinate efforts across state government to reduce emissions and adapt to the impacts of climate change. Now, as EEA Secretary, she oversees the Commonwealth's six environmental, natural resource, and energy regulatory agencies. So please give her a warm welcome. Thank you, Steve, and thank you, Maeve, for that great overview of data. Um, it's terrific to see so many partners and collaborators on this issue in the room today. Um, a special thanks to our legislators who are here. One of the things that's been so wonderful is that we now have agreement from the executive branch, from the House, and from the Senate on the importance of setting a science-based target of net zero emissions for 2050. I'd also like to thank the advocates, uh, many, many who are such great partners on, on leading these efforts and continuing to raise the profile of climate change to the level it is at here in Massachusetts. Um, quite honestly, the, the poll results are not shocking. Uh, I think um, we've recognized the, the, the importance the public is putting on these issues here in Massachusetts and also the leadership role that they really want their state and their community to take on this. And I think we're seeing this in a lot of the stepping up that uh, local officials are doing, that state officials are doing around driving climate action. So I wanted to talk about a few different initiatives um, we are leading at the executive office in close partnership um, with colleagues here in the room today. I think, I think one of the critical challenges um, we face on climate change is not that there is a belief here in Massachusetts it's that it's happening or that there's the experience of seeing it on the ground, which has really changed, I think, a lot since um, both Hurricane Irene in the western part of the state, the nor'easters we've had over the last couple of years, and the sense that um, summer is the sense, and, and the real data that summers are getting a lot warmer, and winters, uh, like the winter we're seeing here, are not so full of snow anymore. But I think where the, where the rubber hits the road in terms of when this becomes to get more challenging is what the solutions are, and how do we deploy them, um, and also the sense that probably on climate change, None of the things we're going to do are going to be free. Uh, there's, this great, there's this great Bill Nye video um, that I would have brought if it wasn't full of expletives this morning. Uh, but it shows, it shows the globe. The globe is on fire. Um, Bill Nye puts it out. Um, and then he says, you know, the earth is burning. What the, are we going to do about it? Um, and then he, he says, you know, I'll explain this to you all I, like I did when you were kids. There's, there's no free lunch here. The solutions we're going to employ are not going to be entirely free. Um, and I think you're also seeing some recognition on that in these poll numbers where people do expect this to affect their life. It's unclear, I guess, from the poll how they expect it to affect their life, but they expect it to affect their life whether they do something or not. Uh, in other words, the solutions will affect their lives as will just climate change continuing. And I think the challenge for all of us is making the case that if you can be part of the solutions and actually design them right, um, they can be beneficial, not just for climate change, but also for society and the way we live our lives. Um, we are certainly seeing this um, as we chase emission reductions. And so getting to net zero um, means, means a lot of leadership from Massachusetts. This, this makes us one of um, three, four states now and a handful of countries who are doing this and we're not scared to be in that position I think because we've always been leading on this issue. We have the Global Warming Solutions Act of 2008 um, that put us front and center of that leadership and with these goals we have to chase emissions in every sector. Um, you, you've all seen us do um, significant work to reduce emissions in the power sector much of that success has been um, at least guided by the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, another multi-state initiative that uh, has driven reductions in the power sector as it's invested $3.3 billion in the economies of the Northeast region. Um, a big win, not only here in Massachusetts, but we've been able to develop that, that regional partnership model where 
we're not just chasing our emission reductions here in the state, we're actually chasing them at, at a bigger scale, which I think is really of critical importance. We are now trying to do the same thing um, with transportation. And I think uh, this poll speaks to the opportunity there, um, as well as the responsibility. It's now 40% of our emissions, um, and it's also a sector that needs investment in what we want to see the clean transportation system of the future look like. Um, and so the Transportation Climate Initiative would be a 11 state um, compact uh, where the states would work to reduce emissions by pricing pollution. Um, and the investment that that would enable would be significant. Um, $500 million a year potentially in Massachusetts that would enable clean buses, clean transit, um, electric vehicle rebates, connectivity, other things that help connectivity in rural communities, including things like high-speed wireless internet so more people can work from home. Um, buses buses, and electric buses in communities that don't have those services now. Um, but a significant re-envisioning of what transportation and mobility look like in a future when we also have to reduce emissions. Uh, notably, I think um, this is a bipartisan group across the states. Uh, Governor Baker has, has been leading the charge on it, but there is strong support um, from states across the region that recognize that to address climate change, you need to reduce emissions in transportation. You can't hit any of our goals without it. But to do it, you can't just put a price on people right away that is so significant they, that they all get out of their cars uh, because they can't afford it. You actually have to give them the options um, and make it affordable for people to take those options uh, so that you're not just penalizing people for what they're, what they're emitting. Um, and so this is, this is a, a fee that would be placed on a fee that would be placed on fuel suppliers. Um, it would allow fuel suppliers to design uh, low carbon fuel uh, to avoid some of the fees, and then it would also invest those fees in options, in options um, to allow people to avoid the price themselves. I'm gonna pause a minute <laughs> um, to catch my breath. Uh, we, we've, been, we've been making the case for TCI now um, for a while, and it's something that we've been working on for 10 years as states. And so this has crossed different administrations, different leadership, and we're at the point now where we're ready to take that next step and uh, sign on to this. And, and you know, I think what's important is that um, it represents a solution that will not only address climate change, but will ultimately improve people's lives everywhere, particularly on that public health element, which is so critical. TCI has the potential to provide um, up to $10 billion in public health benefits. That's uh, fewer days of missed work, fewer respiratory illnesses, um, significant local air pollution comes from our roadways, and it's often in environmental justice neighborhoods. And this is something that I think is so important, is that there is starting to be that recognition of public health. Um, when I started this work on climate change, it was all about nature and wildlife, and, and maybe that's just where I was coming from, but I really have seen the conversation shift to this is really about people and communities and the health of our, the health of our families, the health of our children, um, and the future we're seeing. And so I think the, the nexus here with what reducing transportation emissions can do for public health is significant and will continue to help us um, push the ball forward on this. Certainly, we're seeing um, major investments in offshore wind. Um, we have 1,600 megawatts of offshore wind going through the permitting process now, are excited to look at another 1,600 megawatts more. That's been authorized. Um, also looking to get new solar regulations out and are going through the process um, to permit um, significant hydro, 1,200 megawatts of hydro. We'll obviously have to keep pushing on the renewable and clean energy front there as we plug in more things to the grid. Um, and so that's going to be a significant push going forward. I think we're also looking at what is the role for new and underutilized technologies, whether it's anaerobic digestion, um, geothermal, and then deep energy retrofits and passive house. So um, both reducing consumption and, and looking to these clean, uh, clean supplying um, sources of energy. Another point from the poll that I found very interesting um, was the recognition that, that climate change impacts are being felt by about two thirds of people now or, or experienced 
Um, and also that the expectation is they will be disproportionately experienced in lower income communities. And I think that that's something that we've really been designing our programs at the state level for preparedness around is the idea that the communities that will be hit hardest by climate change impacts are those that are least able to weather the storm. Um, at, the, at the state level, we have a municipal vulnerability preparedness program that helps communities uh, work with all of their citizens to plan for the challenges of climate change. And I think really speaking to what the poll showed in terms of where communities and, and people want to be in terms of their leadership role, and that states and the state and cities and towns should be on the front edge of this. Um, we had 82% of communities now in less than three years sign up to participate in this program. I mean, think about that. That's most of the Commonwealth given just two and a half years and small grants, these are not big grants, these are about $20,000 to help with a planning process in communities um, with then the promise of significantly more money have signed up because they, they realize the impact they're seeing, they're seeing their budgets go up, they're seeing their um, residents deal with more challenges every year and recognize that they need to start doing something about this. And MVP really provides that opportunity not only to prepare for climate change, but to think about what you want your community to be. And I think that's also an important point that speaks to the optimism that you see um, in the poll results, is that this is not all gloom and doom. It's dire, it's an existential threat. The consequences of climate change can be devastating. Um, but if you take a little bit of, I think, the ingenuity of people in this region, and um, I think the hope we all have any of us who have children or friends with kids seeing the next generation and wanting to steward it, um, and you put that into a planning process that then allows you to invest in your infrastructure and invest in your natural resources, invest in your transportation systems, and invest in the social fabric of your communities going forward, there is a real opportunity to look at this as building something significant together while we deal with a challenge. To that end, um, and to the end of communities wanting to take on this challenge head on, uh, we have seen significant need that we have not been able to meet with all of state resources. And so Governor Baker has filed Senate Bill 10. Um, this would provide a sustained and ongoing source of dedicated revenue specifically to deal with the challenge of climate change. We are, we are on pace right now to spend a billion dollars just on resiliency alone. That doesn't cover all of the investments we've been making on the mitigation side of the house. The more we do on mitigation, the less we spend on resiliency. But at this point, we're at the point where we have to spend on both, particularly because we can't control emissions from other parts of the world. We can do our best to lead and to show people how to reduce emissions. Um, we can, all of the emissions, unfortunately, we can't build a, a barrier around Massachusetts and say, you know, this is it, we're not letting any more emissions in. And so we do, have to, we do have to spend significantly on adaptation. I think first and foremost, we look at our current spending and we're working on a plan to make sure all of our capital spending that we do at the state side goes through a filter, looking at how, um, how to make sure we're not further exposing ourselves to risk. We will be the first state um, in the country to actually put all of our spending across all programs through uh, a climate change filter. We also need new revenue. Um, so we're seeing in our MVP program, we're seeing about 30 million or so above um, what we can pay for in asks, and that's not with every community in the program yet. That's also at the design and permitting stage. Um, and so this, this Senate bill to uh, invest in critical infrastructure would create a source of funding about $137 million a year from an increase in the deeds excise fee that's paid at the point of sale by the seller. Um, that would grow to about $10 billion a year to be returned directly to cities and towns to invest in critical infrastructure, to invest in green infrastructure, wetlands, um, beaches, forests, and to invest in, importantly, in programs that increase the equitable uh, distribution of preparedness for communities. One of the things we've seen through MVP, we have a a specific designation um, for communities that are environmental justice communities to get them both involved in planning um, for the future, but also to get more funding for those communities. Um, you know, there's there's significantly more work 
that is needed and um, significantly more funding that is needed there. And so that, that's been a major focus. We're also pleased to have a new environmental justice director um, finally in place to continue to lead that work um, across the Commonwealth. But you know, I think that the fee here is small, but again, it's asking people to pay for something, uh, which is never easy. It's if you're looking at a housing cost um, on a $400,000 house, it's about a $900 increase, so moderate. The, the reason it's put on property is because uh, property is at risk from climate change, and so these investments in critical infrastructure will help property values, and we've seen an erosion um, or a potential risk of erosion in property values due to climate change. I think the, the last thing I'd leave you all with, and making sure I leave time for the panel, um, is again this idea that the people who are most concerned about this are also some of the most optimistic. Um, and that people see their lives changing either way and that they want us in state and local government to lead on this. Um, I think what that means is that we all have to continue to push in our own ways on climate change. There's folks in many different roles here and all of those roles are needed. Um, whether you're an advocate who's raising your voice to emphasize the importance of this challenge in the realm of all other challenges, you know, in, in public health, in um, oh, really? terrorism, I, I forget the list of what you had up there, but you know, making climate change rise up to the, to the top of that list. Um, whether you're in uh, leadership in the, in the House or Senate and trying to make the pitch for the importance of including climate change, um, as what you're doing, or, or in state government, making a role for this in, in designing our programs. And I think the continued importance of designing solutions that are practical, that work for people in Massachusetts, but that can also be modeled regionally, um, and that's an important piece with, with TCI, is that Massachusetts work through a regional coalition gets us 10 times the emissions we could get by working on this by ourselves. And so the opportunity there is not only for us to solve the crisis here in Massachusetts, but for us to lead on this um, around the country and around the world. Thank you for the time, um, and thank you very much for your research on this.